I'm smoking a uh, cigarette uh, link. Listen, there's something I, I, I wanted to talk about. Um, you guys are crazy. Just that, um, y'all niggas complain a lot about games. A lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Every couple of weeks, I see a video pop up about why all of gaming sucks now. I mean, you can swing a stick at them, look. Them motherfuckers do well, too. But every time one of these videos drop, these niggas never say anything. They just all try to pinpoint when games stop being fun for them personally. Some niggas say adulthood. Some niggas say greed. One nigga said after his mom died, like, duh, dude, what the f*** is gonna be fun after that? But what I almost never hear niggas say is anything relevant about what's actually happening to the gaming landscape. They just edge themselves to nostalgia and talk about how the games that were popular when everything was new to them are the best examples of gaming, period. Yummy. Can I get a piece of that ass, Gordon? Hit me up after work today, hon. Which is just getting like you're consuming cock right now. Knock it off. The problem is they use nostalgia as a compass when they need to use it as a reference. It's a launch pad. The point in time in which these concepts and ideas were new to you. Alongside the relevant media at the time that introduced these concepts to you. Let the youth have their shit, you old ass nigga. I seen some niggas in the comments recommend RuneScape to a kid. My nigga, I'm not playing a game older than 9 11, you geriatric. F to you, that's nostalgic. To the homie mob, that game came out in black and white. Fear not though, Mr. CJ is a fucking loser and cares about video games way too much. So let me walk you through my logic, right? Because here's my take. Gaming is still fun. You're, you're, you're just depressed. And all over the place. Seriously. There is like no coordination in this conversation. If we're going to tackle a subject like this, there needs to be some form of objectivity. Something we can all universally agree on, regardless of our own individual biases or references. We shouldn't talk about what's happening with every video game. We should talk about the phenomenon known as gaming itself. <clears throat> Gaming is an art form. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Man, shut your bitch ass up. And with every art form comes an inevitable evolutionary path they follow into mainstream. See, it starts like this. First, you have the art itself. Mm, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Which, over time, evolves into an art form yes, yes 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 i know wait 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 and when that art form mixes into society it becomes a cultural phenomenon but what's the linking chain between these events what's the binding contract under which these events deal in almost exclusively one word innovation actually let me ask you a question, see if we're on the same page. What is innovation? The way I would describe it, all innovation is when you break it down, is forging past current problems to reach a frontier where new problems reside, yes? However, problems are not linear, and how they develop is also not linear. So in order to make sure an art movement can sustain itself long enough to have cultural impact, there are, uh, I would say, four foundational pillars of innovation required to see this happen. Social innovation, monetary innovation, artistic innovation, and technological innovation. I call it SMAT, or suck my asshole, twerp. Social innovation. Oh my god, Luthen, what's good, bro? Nothing much. Thought I'd stop by. Oh, word, word. Sorry if I, uh, scared you. Nah, no, you're good, man. Welcome back, man. Happy to see you. You know, the stigma for a while was that gamers don't go outside, but in actuality, the opposite was true. A lot of the rituals of past gaming generations required a lot of us to have to actually explore our neighborhoods, cities, and areas for access to gaming in general. Niggas had arcades, video stores, amusement parks, fairs, malls, dinner arcades. The actual term is family fun centers, but that sounds pedophilic. If I wanted to play couch co-op with my nigga, he had to like be in my house. Like, he had to be there, which means he had to do shit like clean his room and wash his balls. Y'all knew niggas don't know nothing about that. Don't even try to wait. Because of malignant ignorance on behalf of society and how they treated people into video games, the kind of memories these niggas would make at the meets at the time seemed like quote unquote 
loser shit. But when you look at this pic and you realize there were so many people in this room gaming, they taped this nigga to the ceiling with pizza so he had a spot with them. You realize this shit is culture. These people are friends. These niggas are having a shared experience. Niggas could get all their systems together and make a LAN party. Imagine that. 12 niggas in the same house playing. Oh, oh, Super Smash Bros. Never mind. I know that room smells crazy as fuck. The point I'm trying to make is that the conventions of past generations, literally, Conventions were slowly siphoned out over time and replaced with new rituals. Why? Because the way in which a society interacts with an art piece is dependent on the body in which the art piece is communicated through. And in the case with gaming, that body is technology. This applies to most things, honestly. Here's the thing about that, right? Technological innovation is not only inevitable, but it's necessary, right? However, in the process of progress, for the things in which we gain, there are other things we must siphon out in exchange that we lose, potentially forever. And that is not always necessarily a good thing. Take for example, right? Hold on. There is a series of rituals we as people engage with when acquiring a game, as stated earlier. We were accustomed to those rituals and the work we had to put in to support our hobbies because we felt a genuine connection to the art. But is that true now? What if we purchase a game? Do we truly own it? Is it ours? Is it really mine if I have to wait for expansions? Is it really mine if I have to pay for every new DLC? Season pass, battle pass, skin, pet, vehicle, home, clothing, weapon, map, character. How is Fortnite in early access for two years, but still made one billion dollars in a single month? Am I assembling the game myself with my fucking wallet? At that point, it's not my game. I'm, I'm just paying to play it. And even though all these are definitely monetary innovations, the current form in which they exist in is the consequence of technology allowing it. You know what the f the words are. Always online, free to play, early access, live service. At this point to me, they're just buzzwords to help me identify predatory monetary tactics. And this is a tale as old as time. You know how they talk about like good things come to those who wait and nothing worth having comes without resistance. There's the third quote that is just as true to serves as hindsight. If it's too good to be true, probably is ease of access has given us so many new dimensions to interact with games but at what cost this is purely subjective maybe i don't know but let me weave a line of logic here to help you understand what i mean before the internet humanity was probably dumb as shit. however ignorance is bliss so can you imagine how things were at a time where the internet was evolved enough to where it connected you to things but not evolved enough to where it muddied your connection with that thing technology has made gaming more accessible however at the cost of that accessibility gaming has lost a lot of its ambiance atmosphere and mystery and because technology was developing at the same time as we were we were too busy marveling at the spectacle of it all to realize we never really got a hold on gaming as a culture and so eventually we lost track of it and gaming lost one of its most prominent characteristics as a consequence its sacredness amongst its enthusiasts the current landscape is incredibly volatile and violently expansive with the development of the internet and with an expansion of this magnitude comes the atomization of the gamer The sense of community a lot of game enthusiasts felt when gaming was more centralized has been lost over time for several reasons. The biggest one being that the rituals we use to engage in to interact with games have been replaced with less personalized experiences you now share online. You think of events like the launch of Halo 3 or Modern Warfare 2, how people lined up in literal tents and camped for these games, the electricity and atmosphere surrounding these games, and go, man, gaming used to be so big back then. What happened? It, it, got, it got bigger. It, it got way f***ing bigger. So big you can't comprehend everything because it's all happening at once. It's a lot harder for everyone to homogenize over games because it's a lot harder for people to focus. There's always happening. There's way more people now. There's way more games now. There's way more people playing games now. And all that noise coalesces into a chorus of network minds bantering and debating in micro and macro spheres of discussion. Every game has a Reddit, some YouTuber dedicated to it, a Wikipedia on how to beat it. We used to be 
an experience that was only shared through conversation or word of mouth or actually being there has evolved into an experience so interconnected with social media and the internet that most of our gaming experiences lately have been vicarious experiences. I guarantee you there is a n right now probably you who is a diehard fan of at least two games they have never f***ing touched. I know more FNAF lore than I do Bible quotes and I've never touched either. That's not even a joke. I feel like everybody that just heard that was like, yeah, same. And all these experiences being vicarious consequently give you a third person effect that disallows games to fully grip you like they could when there was no interference between you playing the game and discovering it. Hold on a second. Yeah! Simple question I want you to answer to the comments. When was the last time a game surprised you? I'm talking jaw dropped, open mouth, tears curled, mind blown. Has it been a while? Why is that? I have a couple reasons that aren't just cake shaming microtransactions. You ever told your friend to straight up f***ing lie about a game? I remember when I was a kid and I had four of my homies in the same room and we were playing Fallout 3. I remember we were all comparing the quests we did with each other and for some reason to bring a sense of awe to the game. I lied about an all white dangly limb monster chasing me through the map and when it caught me it would crash my game. I remember all five of us playing Fallout 3 for the next several weeks thinking about that story. And it took four months before anyone realized I was lying. You might have thought I'd done a bad thing, but it kept us playing for four f***ing months. The mystery and excitement of the unknown and what could have kept the game refreshing well after we had completed the most exciting sh** that was actually in the game. The longevity of a game is not just determined by what is, but what also isn't known about it. The mystery generates intrigue, intrigue generates interest, interest generates investment, and that was the way in which discovery functioned as a reward for our own investment into these games. It is what served as the agency for players to not only explore games, but develop a relationship with the games. It's the ideas and self-inserts we made as kids that get carried over into the next generation of gamers, which eventually gets carried over into the next generation of games themselves. That is the way in which games evolve artistically. However, there's a problem, you probably already know it. There has been a disruption in this process of discovery. In the latest years, a lot of gamers have become incredibly jaded with the industry and its practices. The word greed gets thrown around a lot. I would like to add three more. Stagnant, volatile, and exploited. Everybody knows how the industry is greedy. Invasive microtransactions that do nothing for the game artistically and just serve as an interface to drive up sales. But how is the industry stagnant? Hold on. Let me finish this, uh, cigarette. Hi, Bafuba here. At the time of making this video, CJ was going through a series of unfortunate events that climaxed with the death of several loved ones, the selling of his home to avoid foreclosure on it after a fire, and isolation due to abandonment from his biological parents, among other things. So, he took a break, which is why he stopped making videos. Just so you guys stop asking him about it. Many months later. I rolled up another cigarette, let us continue. So let me explain how gaming is stagnant. Hold on. It's not, it's actually volatile. So why do so many people feel as though gaming is dead in the water? Is it the entirety of gaming that's stagnant? Or is it just the companies that you're used to seeing innovate within the gaming industry? Gaming isn't stagnant. The industry is. Remember Skyrim when it first dropped? How exciting was that? Why was that exciting? How many games were like Skyrim before Skyrim dropped? Before Minecraft, Gears of War 3, Red Dead Redemption, Fallout New Vegas, Heavy Rain, Call of Duty Black Ops, Mass Effect 2, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Halo Reach, Bioshock 2, Darksiders, Amnesia, Super Mario Galaxy 2. These are all games that released oh, in shit. just the year of 2010. Again. If you move the dial up three more years, we get cultural landmarks like Borderlands 2, GTA 5, Witcher 3, Far Cry 3, and Halo 4. And the crazy part is that most of these games were never done before. How many games felt like Black Ops before Black Ops? Gears of War before Gears of War? God of War before God of War? What the f*** even is Minecraft? The spectacle and magic of the industry wasn't just because we were young and inept. We grew up at a time where innovation was simple, and all of our first experiences were ground 
groundbreaking experiences. It wasn't just new to us. The technology was new, period. And so the opportunity to tell new stories was abundant. But the crazier part was how fast things were evolving. Let me help you understand how rapidly we progressed. In the year 2000, the most popular video game sold was Tetris. By 2010, it was Call of Duty Black Ops. By 2011, Minecraft and Skyrim drop. I'll take it a step further. In 1990, the two most popular games sold were Final Fight and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. By the year 2000, the PS2 dropped. And that's what upsets me about a lot of these video essays. They express the lack of new ideas as a consequence of solely greed and no other factor when even if greed wasn't a factor they still have to tackle the considerable task of innovating on what we have and what we have is virtually every f***ing thing it's not that there's less games being made it's that there's less memorable games being made how many of you played the new saints row game you know they spent a hundred million f***ing dollars making that sh nobody f***ing played it it sucks uh, i just remember the forsaken type in uh, for forespoken i forgot the fucking name these games are generic unoriginal and boring they don't even feel as though they have their own identity just reskins there's no new original ideas good enough to even catch our attention coming out of these fucking studio it's not that games are harder to make now because of supply and demand it's it's more like uh, the simpsons dilemma Okay, you know that one episode of South Park where Butters is trying to constantly innovate on ways to take over the town as Professor Chaos, but every time he does, his friend tells him, Simpsons did it, and his idea is unoriginal? That problem is now also prevalent in the gaming industry. Every developer is trying to come up with something new right now, when they don't even have to. They just have to take what we have and do it better. But I don't even think developers of big studios even get that chance. Because what the people above them want is something that will sell. Something that is addicting. Something that they can monetize. And yeah, I, I, I get it. When Shepard betrayed Ghost and Roach in Modern Warfare 2, that was probably the first time you ever experienced those emotions with those characters. And that's probably why you're still attached to that franchise to this day. However, while I cannot create a new emotion, I can create a new experience. But those new experiences never get the chance to flourish because we limit our view to ideas that will make money. That means no risks, which means no experimentation, which means no creativity. Stagnancy in the industry tricks us into believing there is nothing better to be made, and so we end up fighting over the scraps we're left with instead of asking where the food is. That is how we are being exploited. The launch of this game was a no! complete disaster. All that good ass wasted game with an empty world of boring story. I played like five hours of it and I was like, I'm done. I don't like this game. How are we being exploited? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Seriously, I don't know. Because we all seemingly agree on these subjects, right? We all seemingly agree that these things are not good, and yet these things still persist. We all don't like microtransactions, and yet FIFA has still made $1.7 billion each year since 2016. We all don't like live services, and yet Genshin Impact has made more money in one month than Elden Ring has in sales its entire lifespan. We all don't like re-releases, and yet Skyrim is on its seventh. Despite the bombardment of negative coverage and unanimous online consensus, there is still a saliable mass of people that completely buy into these systems, and because of that, we can no longer vote with our wallets. The $60 you abstain from spending gets spent faster than you can even think to abstain from spending it. In the year 2000, the global capital of the gaming industry combined was $7.98 billion USD. In 2023, that number is now 365 billion. The Leviathan has swelled to a size where even millions are just droplets in a bucket. And that is because the average consumer is neither concerned nor aware of the various ways the industry is exploiting them. And the industry itself does not care to stop the exploitation since it benefits. As long as there is bait, there will be fish. As long as there is prey, there will be predators. As long as there are people to be exploited, there will be people willing to exploit them. 
And such is the way, the only way, the worst way in which we innovate monetarily. I want to take this time to point out, every other form of innovation directly benefits the art itself. Social innovation benefits the art itself. Technological innovation benefits the art itself. Artistic innovation benefits the art itself. Monetary innovation bends the art over a table, sexually assaults it, then gaslights it afterwards, and says it is consensual. Like I said, innovation exists on a spectrum, and not all innovation is good innovation. Every action has a consequence, and not everything that evolves alongside other things evolves to our benefit. As the art evolves, the tools necessary to create the art evolve as well. Better tools make for better art, and with better art comes better artists and better rituals around the art. However, it all literally comes at a price, under the current system in which art attempts to thrive in. Capital. My financial advisors have informed me that calling capitalism the root of all our problems is controversial. But it's true. Like, everything is expensive, the planet is dying, I don't f*** the war, I, I just want to live. These are not political stances, these are anti-dying stances. Art does not thrive under the current system in which it exists in. Money does. Greed is not a consequence of capitalism. It is the basis under which capitalism exists. It's its backbone. It's how you thrive in a capitalistic society. The freedom that we witness things have at their nucleus, at their origin of conception, is the freedoms things have when the maws of Uncle Sam don't come clamping down on it like a f***ing tick. The reason why everything you love dies is because it doesn't get renewed for a second season, because the stream numbers were too low, not because it's bad f***ing art. Capitalism has become so ingrained as the game of life, we associate money with quality. We associate good art with high stream numbers, we associate success with net worth, all of us do. Which means gaming is not an exception, and the people who make video games apply this mindset to art. In fact, they prioritize this mindset over art. The way it always happens, and this is like every art movement ever, from music to f***ing sword swallowing, right? You got this event. The movement starts off pure. Passion and authenticity is always what starts an artistic renaissance of any sort. The start of gaming didn't even have a single gamer or developer or studio or publisher. This came from every background under the umbrella of fun. CEOs, car salesmen, librarians, nail technicians, f***ing ex-military all started adopting the language necessary to make games by sheer force of will. And when they came together, they weren't concerned with what would sell, they were concerned with what would be fun to play. Hey, hey, I like tennis. I like tennis too. We should make tennis, tennis for two. two. Hey, hey. Do you like Pong? I love Pong. We should make Pong. Pong. Hey, hey. Wanna play Dungeons and Dragons? On a computer? Yeah. What's your favorite starter class? Oh. Uh, Rogue. Innovation is always at its best when nothing has been done before because then people can just do what they want. And in that process, a forward momentum starts to whir. The ideas, they aren't just contained to small groups and enthusiasts anymore. They start showing people, telling people of these ideas. And in that process, attention gets drawn to the art. And in that process, more people interact with the art. And in that process, more people start to know of the art's existence, which leads to more people starting to like the art, which then leads to more people wanting to buy the art. The potential for art is no longer contained to its ability to make memories, but is now being measured in its ability to make money. Your art is no longer being crafted by artists. It is being manufactured by businessmen. It's no longer seen as a means to shape the mind and deliver an experience. It is now seen as a means to push a market and make more money. And that's it, honestly. That's where we are now. There is no need to extrapolate further. But it's not enough to talk about the symptoms of the sickness we have to talk about the sickness itself we have to talk about the system itself you know i noticed this aversion from directly talking about it but you know capitalism is the reason why we're suffering right it kills everything it touches because it's a system based in a destructive mindset the way i see it as someone who does not give two f about economics it just views the system externally capitalism is just feudalism expanded 
is just that process faster. You see companies like Corpos. I see them more like um, House Lannister, where we once conquested for land and resources with soldiers and generals, we do so now with contracts and suits. Like if this was the 1400s, Mr. Beast would be fucking Jimmy the Peaceful. In a world now dominated by economics, legality, ethics, and business, the intellectual property is now the new property, and the marketplace of ideas is the new land grab. That is where you'll find your new nobles, your new lords, your new kings conquesting for land and resources. So can we hit 10,000 likes? Make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, and turn on notifications for that next big Arch Wizard CJ upload. And that is my point exactly. Art needs to exist freely in order to evolve correctly. But how can art exist freely in a system where literally nothing is free? It can't. So it evolves incorrectly. It becomes corrupted by capitalism. Another business. Right now we're talking about video games, but you realize this phenomenon happens everywhere, right? Music, movies, television, sports, science. You don't think it's strange that everyone just so happens to be having the exact same conversation at the exact same time? time these video essays you see pop up about gaming are just as frequent in cinema just as frequent in music just as frequent in sports that's how you know it is not just any one field it is the f***ing system it's actually the man they killed Kenny, those bastards. Capitalism doesn't breed competition, it demands tribute to maintain its system. Your work under capitalism is not yours. It is a tithe you pay to a billionaire who already owns your market, which in turn means they own you since you cannot exist in this system without interacting with what they own. And when I mean you can't exist, you literally cannot live an actual life unless you go around or exploit the system. You work five days a week to sleep for two just for you to earn enough money to survive for 30. That is not a life, that is a legal slave. The phenomenon we are witnessing is not exclusive to art or even artists. This system is literally corrupting and killing everything it touches because it is a system based in conquest, meaning when all that's left is late stage capitalism, it will eventually just eat itself like a f***ing cancer. That is why everywhere you look, everyone is so disenfranchised because in this system you are treated like a product or stock or consumer. You are not being treated like a human being, you have no genuine human connections. Business is so invasive to our daily life, we have even found ways to monetize concepts like love, friendship, your very f***ing vitality in this system is a business. This is not a system that promotes life, it is a system that makes you wish for death. And this feeling is worsened by a lack of genuine art. The doom and gloom based in the misfortune that befalls around us is worsened by the fact there is no meaningful art to counterbalance it. And not being able to see yourself in the art you consume, you feel alone, vulnerable, afraid, isolated, unmotivated, with nothing to help you parse these emotions, with nothing to help you understand what you're experiencing, all these thoughts and emotions are locked in your head and with nothing to look forward to and no one around to look up to. Where else are you to fix your gaze but down at the ground so you're not constantly staring into a fucking void? But me personally, I, I, I'm so over this sh I, I'm, I'm finna just talk. Reality has a left-leaning bias. Despite the way things look and despite the way things may feel, we see throughout history time and time again, we forcibly drag along these bad actors and make progress in spite of them anyway. And this point in history is no different. Even though profit incentive is bottleneck creativity into a point of near cultural stagnation, it is inevitable we as humans will innovate past these barriers and force change in the process. We see it now. Elden Ring, Remnant 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Armor Core 6, the mainstream once again is seeing some groundbreaking innovation, a return to form from some studios and a potential new height for other studios. And it's just proof that we as humans are the true X factor in making amazing things, not fing profit. The thing I ask and urge everyone, however, is that we, as the latest generation to become adults, are more aware of these things happening and we have more conversation about these things. We keep wanting to pretend that we're still children, we're not. 
This is our world now, and if we want to push the boundaries for change, if we want to unshackle art from the cancerous grip of profit, then at the very least, the very, very least, we gotta support each other. And we got to support the things we do want to see moving forward. We got to be more conscious as people and recognize the why behind the feelings we harbor and things we're experiencing. And remember, you are not interacting with just an idea right now. We are having a conversation, one that needs to be had. The disparity you feel is a system that doesn't allow you to feel. It just wants you to keep your head down so it can keep using you. So let's not do that. Let's keep our heads up. Let's stay woke. Woke, creeping, they gon' find you, gon' catch you sleeping, ooh. I really don't get the complacency from a lot of you. Is it, 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 like seriously, is it really that scary to try something new when the alternative is living a life that would make you wish you were dead any fucking way? I will not be irresponsible and demand that we stage a fucking coup, but at the very least, this conversation needs to be had. This idea needs to be known and this understanding needs to be met. There is still true art being made, however much like the indie games that struggle to break to the surface, that true art still struggles to gain momentum because it is fighting against a monopoly. Being an adult had nothing to do with why you can't enjoy what you used to. You do not get older and simply stop enjoying because you are a human being. You will continue to have human experiences. You will continue to find new reasons to enjoy life. Art will prevail because art is the human experience. There's still fun games to be played. Those are just not the ones currently being made. If you feel this is a video worth sharing, please share it. If this is a video you feel is worth liking, please like it. If you feel it's a channel worth subscribing to, then please subscribe. And if you feel there's a person that should see this, invite them to join in on the conversation. In fact, let's continue the conversation and join the Discord in the description down below. And if the people complaining are saying that video games are no longer fun, make sure to let them know that video games are still fun. You're just depressed because of capitalism.